Hello, friends and family, and welcome to the Crippling Anxiety Global Pandemic Meditation Hour. Um, as usual, the ground rules are this is not meditation instruction. I'm not a meditation teacher. Um, everything that we're discussing is just uh, guidance um, toward meditation or about meditation. Um, today, I wanted to revisit uh, two topics, one which I've mentioned um, or alluded to, and one which we've discussed directly. Um, the direct topic was bubblegum zen, and uh, the indirect topic was bad meditation advice. The idea that there is bad meditation advice um, may at first seem uh, close-minded, it may seem disrespectful, um, and I certainly mean no disrespect to the meditation teachers or meditation schools which uh, espouse these techniques or um, philosophies, choices of teaching. However, uh, I do think that one of our previous topics, Remain Skeptical, is, um, is valuable to continue to remain in force with if that makes sense. Um, always, always keep your skepticism at the ready. And especially in the early days of any practice um, that you are like, giving a trial to, it's wise to examine intellectually the technique that is being taught to you and the method of teaching. There, there are some specifically bad instructions which are bad in the sense that they are ineffective. They are ineffective in the way any other instruction would be ineffective. If I wanted to learn tennis and someone gave me an instruction like just be in the moment. That is not specific. It is not actionable. And it's not something I can rationalize and internalize. And these are all important properties of meaningful meditation instruction. Meditation instruction should be actionable. It should be a thing that you can begin doing and continue to do. <laughs> that, would, that would be the entire meaning in having a practice. Um, and meditation, uh, meditation efforts are usually referred to as a practice in the way that you would practice a musical instrument, in the way that you would practice a sport, and I think especially, especially when we're starting out and we are all starting out, it's important to look at it through that lens. There are higher stages. There are higher stages to meditation and you will probably experience them however briefly, sooner rather than later. Um, you may be surprised to experience them, that's fine. But especially in the early days of your meditation practice, especially when you're experimenting, you won't experience these high stages of meditation. Um, and even in the moments where you experience those high stages of meditation, extremely vague meditation instructions are not helpful to you. 
they become a part of the way that those high stages of meditation work. Um, there is a vocabulary that is sort of um, emerged, I suppose, in the public consciousness regarding meditation, often from people who do not meditate. Um, and it's not, it's not incorrect. The vocabulary is not incorrect. But you'll hear things like um, the uh, annihilation of the ego, um, the discovery of non-self, uh, the awareness of non-self, awareness in awareness, and these sorts of things. In your early meditation practice, these points do not bear on the way that you learn meditation and they won't bear on the way that you practice meditation. Um, this won't become a day-to-day -day thing. Um, the higher stages of meditations uh, are daily practices for monks and nuns, not for us. Um, we will experience these deep meditative states on occasion, on retreat, when we've been meditating very seriously for a long time. Um, and I mean, even a 10-day retreat is enough. But um, initially, this is not the case. And so in our day-to-day -day practice, these high philosophies, these ideas, these paradoxes, um, which are presented as meditation instruction are very unhelpful if they're not actionable. And I'd like to go over some examples. Um, the first is this, uh, this idea and this very dangerous idea that you are already there, that there's nothing to do, there's nothing to achieve, that there's nothing to accomplish. This is untrue. <laughs> unless you are already a mastered meditator, unless you've already perfected your practice, whatever it may be, you are not there. Um, and if you're not sure about this, um, do, do some serious meditation practice. Um, Part of the reason I suggest Vipassana is because it is highly unlikely you will get through the 10 days without at least a glimpse, if not large vistas, of um, this thing on the other side. And what you start to see is um, the, the road, right, from here to there. You're, you've started progression, but the road itself is visible to you. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a, I can go somewhere with this. Um, and I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> there is something at the end of the road. There is a goal um, that you have in mind. And the, the philosophy which embodies this idea um, is again not incorrect, but it's not helpful to us as beginners. If you just say, oh, you're already, a, you're already enlightened, you're already a master meditator, then you'll just go on playing video games and watching TV and other, whatever other masturbatory activities we engage in at the sensory level, right? That's not helpful. And if you still have behaviors, you express your anger, you suppress other feelings, um, you hurt people, you hurt yourself, for whatever reason, to whatever degree, then you're not there yet. Um, and there is some work that you can do. And um, this is this is the reason that I, th I think that this idea um, is so dangerous is because it's very easy to say um, it's not it's not ineffable right it's not it's not some mysterious thing to say oh you're already enlightened 
congratulations, so there's nothing for you to do. Um, but it's an easy out that all of us have probably taken at some point in our lives. We said, oh yeah, was, the universe is all one thing and I'm just made up of leftover star poop. And um, nihilism to an extent um, can, uh, can feed into um, the, a similar philosophy that, that's not helpful. That it doesn't give you an activity to engage in. Um, and so I would say th this particular philosoph philosophy or idea that we, are <clears throat> that we are already enlightened, that we are already there, we should leave that aside, especially initially. <clears throat> um, other meditation instruction that I've been given that I found extremely unhelpful um, are things like just sit, just sit. Okay, <laughs> and then what? Um, and just to sit is um, it's a it's a sister non instruction to do nothing, but just just do nothing. Um, okay, that's also not helpful because again, this is this is a possible stage, right? That you may see, you may catch a glimpse of whatever, um, at higher stages in deeper meditative states where you realize that the idea of the, the doer and the observer are, these are constructions and these are images and et cetera, et cetera. But until you experience it yourself, until you feel that, even for a moment, this is just an idea. And the moment it stops, Right? The moment that you are not feeling exactly that, it's still an idea. It's back to being an idea. So just because you've been experienced a philosophy, just because you've seen God or whatever it is in meditation for an instant, if you're not right now, then whatever it is that you saw is no longer true for you. That's the past. That's imagination. That's memory. That's not what's actually happening right now. Um, and it, it's important for us to stick with what we know to be true. That's one of the inherent values of a good meditation is that it, you meditate on what is true, inherently true, not some truth that you've been told. Um, oh, you don't exist. These are just philosophies. These are just ideas. Um, and that we remain in the present moment, which means whatever is true now. So even if it's a philosophy we've experienced ourselves in the past, if we're not experiencing it now, it goes back to being a philosophy. It becomes a book on the shelf. It's a book we wrote, that's fine, but it's just a book. It's, it's not true at the moment. Um, The, this actually uh, leans on a, another form of meditation advice that I find extremely common these days. And part of the reason I wanted to do this video is it felt like the term bubble gums in and the examples I gave in the previous video were perhaps a little hard on Zen specifically. I mean, it's a bad naming on my part, but Zen is, there's nothing wrong with Zen and there's certainly nothing wrong with the meditative practice um, taught in Zen. Um, and when I say bubblegum Zen, I don't mean specifically Zen. Um, and this instruction, which you no doubt hear, you see it written on shopping bags and notebooks and whatever is be in the moment there is only now, etc., etc. Um, again, true, again, not actionable. Okay, sit there. 
and be in the moment. How do I do that? <laughs> there, there has to be some object to the meditation. Um, and the present moment is not an object of meditation. Um, it is a philosophy, and you can actually make a philosophy an object of meditation. But it's not a very useful one because you don't know that it's true. Um, so there is an inherent danger in meditating on something that feels right, feels true. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, like that the present moment is the only moment that exists. Oh, okay, there's no such thing as time. There's only my, my current perception of the universe is the only perception. And it's moving forward through what I would call time. But really, there's, there's only this now, right now, this moment. Well, okay, so what? Um, what to do with that information? There's nothing you can do with that information. You need a meditation object which is outside of philosophy. Um, this is why the breath is a pretty good meditation object. It is current. It is now. You don't meditate on the last breath. You don't meditate on the breath from five minutes ago. You... So almost certainly won't even remember those breaths because they're not so interesting that you'll get bound up in them. Uh, you can, right? Occasionally there'll be a breath that'll be like, wow, that was a weird breath. And then you'll think about it for a couple of minutes. Oh, weird breath, weird breath. Oh, right. I'm supposed to be with this breath, the one, <laughs> the one that's actually happening at the moment. But you have a meditation object there, which is true. It's an inherently true. It's happening. It's real. These are real sensations that are causing you to be aware of the fact that you are breathing. And it is inherently within the moment. So you don't have to visualize some fantastic philosophy or even simple philosophy of the now. It's not necessary. Um, the now is simply what you're experiencing at the moment. And you can find a meditation object which is also true, which is also real. There, there are other meditation instructions um, which are, they're sort of derivative of actionable meditation instructions. So just let it go would be one. Um, and you hear this even outside of meditation. You hear people, you get upset and, oh, we're like, that guy doored me while I was riding my bicycle and I mean, I'm not really injured, but I'm cut up a little bit. I fell off my bike. Someone says, oh, just let it go. That's not a thing <laughs> that human beings are equipped to do. And it, a really solidified emotion has come from these undercurrents, right? The undercurrents are constantly there within your body, within your mind, wherever you think your mind is at the moment. Um, there are aggregate components of mind that they get re reified as things that we recognize, right? I have a thought or I have an emotion. And if that emotion is anger toward another person, it's a rock by the time I know what it is, right? It's too late. I just, oh, just let go of this rock. But how? How do I let go of the rock? And so what is valuable about the idea of letting something go is um, kind of the idea of just waiting. Uh, you can't, let it go implies that you have some agency here. By the time a, th a thought or an emotion is reified in your mind, all agency is lost, right? If you are angry, you can't think your way out of being angry. That's not a thing that you can fake it, but the anger is there as long as it's there. And so letting something go is letting that thing dissolve on its own and it'll fade. And you again need a meditation object. And if you were to meditate on the anger itself, it just gets worse and worse and worse if it's serious anger for any value of serious. 
So the, the idea of letting something go is really rooted in the idea of acceptance. Um, and that's a little bit more tangible. We're not quite to fully tangible yet, but that's actionable. Begin with accepting what is happening right now. The sun is going down. It's 6.30 p.m. These are, these are facts I accept. <laughs> okay, I'm accepting them. Basic, like very reified surface level facts. And to accept is to accept whatever is happening, right? And a lot of what is happening during meditation is kind of unpleasant for some value of unpleasant. So if my meditation is supposed to be on the breath, and my awareness keeps drifting away, some thought, some emotion, maybe it reifies, maybe it has enough time to get solid, maybe I'm just, oh, my mind is, one, oh, okay, the breath, the breath. Um, the acceptance is over here. I have to accept, oh, oh, okay, my mind is wandering. My mind has wandered, right, fully wandered. My one mind has been wandering and wandering, oh, okay, it's been five minutes <laughs> and I haven't felt a single breath. Okay, come back to the breath. I would gently accept and, and go back to the exercise, the very actionable, very reified exercise. Um, there's one more instruction that I hear, I think I hear this the most, um, in yoga classes, oddly enough, um, the, uh, the idea is go inside yourself. Um, oh, go inside. Like, the answers are inside. Okay. <laughs> Again, like kind of spirituality literature and um, I think I mentioned the alchemist before. Like, the, there, there are a number... It, countless books of this ilk that will will say the same thing oh you need to stop worrying about outside you need to come inside like inside of what inside my thoughts inside my emotions inside my ideas um, this is not entirely obvious from the instruction go inside and if we use uh, Vipassana or even Zazen as an example, but particularly Vipassana, the whole idea is you start from the outside. You start with sensations that are extremely gross, extremely easy to detect. I'm wearing a shirt. That's a sensation. It's hot outside, so I'm sweating. That's a sensation. I have a sensation of breathing. These are sensations. The sensations inside are much harder to feel. Um, if I sit and I just try to feel what's inside right now, I mean, I have a small backache, <laughs> but I'm not feeling anything of real significance inside. And so the idea of go inside is, is very real. It's very concrete. You can get in there, um, but it takes practice and it takes time. You won't go straight inside right away, or people would be doing that all over the place. If it was an easy thing to do, you wouldn't need to take a 10-day course to learn how even to begin, much less how to master this idea. Um, and that brings me to what I would consider the most frustrating um, of meditation concepts <laughs> that I hear from time to time. This, I don't tend to hear this as a meditation instruction, or at least not often, um, but you hear it from people who advocate not meditating. Um, so I've asked, I've asked some, some people in my life who've tried meditation, or maybe they haven't, um, and why why they don't men meditate regularly. I'm surprised that the, they don't get more out of it. And um, the response that I occasionally receive is, oh, 
I, I'll just be aware of everything that's happening as it happens all the time. And this is, again, a thing that you can do. Again, very high stage. Um, it's, it's possible to be aware of the, the subtler realities inside our body, inside our minds. Where does anger come from? Where does sadness come from? At the bottom of those things, in their smallest pieces. It's possible to be aware of that constantly and to keep going deeper and deeper constantly, but it's a really hard task and it requires um, a lot of focus for most of us. It requires complete silence for most of us. The idea that you can be watching TV and keep your awareness inside um, at a deep, meaningful level, at a useful, subtle level where it's changing the habits that you've established in your life is a fantasy. Um, nobody's doing that. Monks and serious, serious high-level meditators that you will meet, they are often struggling with this thing. Oh, all the time. I have to be meditating all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, as I'm falling asleep, while I'm dreaming, um, for the monks and the nuns, even in deep sleep, they, they will manage to continue meditating and then they're meditating as soon as they wake up. Um, this is a, a very real thing. This is a very real activity that um, people engage in. It's extremely difficult. And so the idea that you can just say, oh, I'm just, I'm just paying attention to everything all the time implies that you've mastered meditation already. Oh, I'm as good at meditating as a monk with 60,000 hours of practice. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> We're beginners. Um, and so I, th I think that, that that idea, much like the idea, oh, you're already there, you're already enlightened, is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous only because it prevents people from trying. Um, an equivalent would be, perhaps, to avoid a healthy diet because you already feel healthy. Oh, I did. I can just eat, you know, burgers and poutine all the time because I'm already healthy. Well, yeah, you're 17, so, <laughs> so your body isn't falling apart yet, but maybe it's not the best idea to establish these habits of unhealthy eating. Or similarly, um, for people who don't find it difficult to keep weight off, um, who don't find it difficult to maintain their own individual health, um, that exercise is, oh, I don't need to exercise. I'm, I'm healthy all the time. Well, kind of, but the big challenges in your life haven't really come up yet, have they? Those happen when you're 60, 70. 80, 90 years old. This is the time <laughs> in your life which you will enjoy a lot more if you've been exercising and eating right and potentially meditating. And so if you go through life when things are relatively easy, right, in our 20s and 30s and 40s, um, saying, oh, I'm just paying attention to everything all the time, um, this is a bit of self-delusion that is really preventing a person from trying something valuable. And only to try it, right? I mean, if you're 30 years old and you try meditation, you try a few different techniques maybe, and none of it is valuable to you, you're just like, this is a bunch of hocus and I don't, I don't need any of this, fine, you know what, maybe you're really healthy and you don't need exercise and okay, leave it aside. But it's worth trying. Um, and these are impediments. One, you're already there, that idea that you're already enlightened, which is a bit some kind of a high philosophy kind of impediment. And then I'm just paying attention to 
all sensory stimulation all the time, constantly, um, is, I'm going to think a little bit arrogant for any of us to actually say, um, not necessarily a high philosophy, it just sort of, uh, <laughs> it implies um, quite a lot for an individual. So I, I think that this is um, perhaps uh, a more useful take um, on this idea of bubble gum zen. I'd be curious to hear what any of you think about it. Um, but uh, these are the caveats that I would provide um, while you're learning to meditate and while you're experimenting with different meditation techniques. Uh, I have my timer here. And it is set to 10 minutes. If you want to start your own timer, you can pause the video now, um, set up a timer for yourself. And I will start now.
that's our timer for today. Thank you for meditating with me and um, hearing what I have to say about bad meditation advice. I hope that you're able to find some meditation advice and meditation instruction that works for you. Um, I hope that you're all managing to stay healthy and safe and that you're taking care of yourselves. We will see you tomorrow. Good night.